Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Andy Jimenez. I'm a Vice President of Technology with Annexter. I'm based outside of Chicago. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Annexter, we're a global distributor of infrastructure solutions. So that's copper, twist pair copper, fiber, and wireless solutions. We do have a global footprint, so we have a presence in over 50 countries around the world. So whatever type of project you're doing, if it's an AV project or an IT upgrade, a security project, we can source your, your uh, project pretty easily across the world. So we're a new member uh, of SDVOE. We just became an adopter member, I'd say about two months ago, and we're very excited to be you know, part of the organization. And one of the things we're excited about with SDVOE is, is really the transport, which is ethernet. Uh, so we've been involved with a lot of IP-based uh, solutions over the years, and you know, Ethernet has a lot of benefits. So while we have a lot of focus at this show around all the different devices and appliances, uh, you don't have anything without infrastructure. So without infrastructure to transport data and power to the different devices, you really don't have much of a solution. So with today's session, we're going to focus primarily on IP-based infrastructure uh, for AV applications. Again, we'll, we'll pay particular focus to the twist pair copper and optical, but we'll also touch on wireless as well, because that has a play in this uh, solution uh, as well. So, what I'd like to do is go through a little history of premise networks and ethernet in general. You know, back in the 1980s, uh, there was many different protocols available to transport data across a corporate network. Uh, you had bus and ring protocols, uh, primarily with different cabling systems uh, generally involved with those. Uh, eventually, after the, um, the IEEE published the 802.3 in 1983 for Ethernet, uh, the industry consolidated around Ethernet as a protocol. So from a protocol perspective, that was a pretty important milestone because really for the first time, we could consolidate across a single protocol framework to deliver information across corporate networks. And by doing so, by standardizing on a single protocol environment, it allowed us to do very interesting things across the network. So really the the first integrated platform that was non-data that, that kind of came onto the network was voice over IP in the 2000s. Uh, over the last 10 to 15 years, we've been heavily involved in the physical security space. So that's video surveillance and access control. So we've seen, again, a consolidation of technology across the Ethernet protocol uh, for, for surveillance applications as well as for access control applications. And really, again, what it allow you to do, uh, since you kind of put everything on a single framework, standardized framework, uh, you could also deliver uh, information across uh, your cabling system in a standardized way. So rather than using multiple cabling systems now to deliver data and power, you could deliver it over a standardized structured cabling system. So for instance, in a camera, the old analog systems had a coaxial based uh, you know, cable for the, for the video, you had a serial cable for pencil zoom control, then you had a separate set of wires for power. But with Ethernet-based systems, power and data can be transferred, as well as control can be transferred across a single cabling system. So that was really an important distinction. So that market has really evolved. You've seen a lot of transfer of technology from analog to IP. And today where we're at now is really around the automation space. So I recently was at the IBCon conference. That's where I spent the bulk of my time this week. And it was all about building automation. So commercial lighting. Uh, PoE-based lighting is starting to be, become more interesting in the, in the, in the um, commercial building space, primarily because of the integration benefits, because now I can basically integrate all of these different subsystems that were normally disparate, I can now communicate very seamlessly with the Ethernet protocol across all of these systems and do it in a very standardized way. So building automation, industrial automation, we're starting to see a lot of you know, activity and interest around the Ethernet protocol and standardization. Uh, the last subsystem, I've, I put a question mark here, that's fire and life safety. You know, Justin had uh, presented earlier, you know, talking about the non-deterministic nature of Ethernet. It's all packet-based switching, TCP IP, non-deterministic. It's very difficult, at least in a fire and life safety application, to deploy that type of protocol because everything has to be deterministic, which means that all the different components and subsystems have to be continuously monitored across a fire and life safety system. So you have like pull stations and smoke detectors and sirens. Those are continuously monitored in a bus in a loop. Um, so constantly supervised across the network. So from that point of view, you know, Ethernet may or may not have a play. And also there's a liability component around the fire and life safety systems as well. So 
From a monitoring point of view, we may see you know, some penetration of Ethernet uh, from a monitoring perspective, but you know, across the board, we haven't seen a wholesale migration of the Ethernet protocol for fire life safety systems, but it remains to be seen. So really at the foundation of all, uh, we, we hear a lot about IoT, Internet of Things, uh, at the building conference. This is really one of the primary topics that was talked about, but really at the foundation is the Ethernet protocol and the structure cabling system because what the structure cabling system allows you to do is again through a standardized uh, infrastructure I can support multiple applications running over the network and the other thing too is that it runs over a standardized interface the RJ45 interface so across the world you know I can deploy these projects and specify a single cabling plant with a single physical interface and it's going to support all these different applications and subsystems so what I'm talking energy monitoring your lighting control, and then now commercial AV, I can support all of these applications across the foundational structure cabling system. And also from an um, infrastructure perspective, I can deliver both power and data through the Ethernet system uh, to support all of these applications. So that really gives you a lot of benefits to launch a lot of interesting types of, types of applications you know, across your network. So again, nothing really works. The IoT is not enabled unless you've got a solid physical infrastructure to deliver all the information. So what I'm going to do now is really walk you through some of the, ver the vari uh, various options from a media perspective. We'll, we'll look at Twisted Pair Copper first. And what I thought would be useful is just to walk you through the nomenclature that's used to identify copper cabling. And it's based on the ISO 11801 specification. But you can see here uh, with the matrix, uh, the, the first two positions of the matrix really define the jacketing of, of the cable. and then. The, the next three positions identify the internal elements. And I've got a graphic on the next slide that'll explain it a little bit better. But that's basically how you define the physical media of the twisted pair cable. So for this example, if we're using a braid and foil screen on the jacket and we're using foil screen on the individual um, twisted pair element, that would be identified as SFTP. And to show this a little bit more visually, I've got all the twisted pair variants here on this chart. So on the upper left-hand side, if you're using uh, unshielded, uh, no shield on your jacket, and you've got no shield on the individual twisted pair elements, that's identified through the ISO matrix as a UUTP cable type. But in North America, we just call that UTP for shorthand. And there's different types of performance levels associated with UTP, uh, category 5E, category 6, and 6A. Uh, there's also the ISO classifications that you could use as well, which are class D, Class E and Class EA. Uh, another uh, popular North American uh, cable type is called uh, FUTP or FTP. That's foil twisted pair. And again, you've got all the different variants there. The only addition is Category 8, which is the highest performing cabling system that you can uh, spec today. Uh, so that's uh, you know, kind of identified there on the lower left hand side. And then uh, the other two uh, cable types are the shielded twisted pair cables, and those are called SFTP uh, or pairs in metal foil. Uh, these aren't used quite often in uh, the U.S. or North American markets. This is primarily you see in Europe. Uh, so these have a braid across the jacket and then the individual pairs. You can see there's a foil across the individual uh, you know, twisted pairs. And that's called SFTP. Uh, and again, uh, there's different variations of performance. There's Category 7 as well as Category 8. Uh, so th those are the defined media types that you can use for twisted pair cable. Now, from an application perspective, Ethernet has specified multiple data rates that you can support across these media types. So there's one gigabit per second, uh, two and a half and five gigabits per second. Uh, that was defined in the 802.3BZ standard. That's called a multi-rate PHY. Then you've got 10 gigabit per second or 10 G base T, which was uh, supported under the, uh, the IEEE 802.3AN, which was published in 2006. And then you've got the 25 and 40 G base T, which is a uh, category eight uh, media type, which was uh, supported under the uh, 802.3 BQ. So those are all the varying data rates that you can support across different media types. And then the cable grades, you've got category 5E to category eight. So with this chart, it's, it's a little bit of a, an eye chart, but what it shows you is that depending on the cabling media, you're gonna be limited to the type of application that you can support. So for instance, with category 5E, it's specified for gigabit ethernet, as well as two and a half gigabit. 
Uh, you can use it for five gig applications, but there's going to be some limits in terms of the distance that you can support across a Category 5 e, uh, cabling system. Uh, category 6, uh, you can support and specify up to five gig. Uh, you can use it for 10 gig applications, but in, in most instances you'll be limited to anywhere between 37 and 55 meters. And the reason for that is that, you know, there's, um, as you start modulating the signals at a, at a higher rate, uh, you have to worry about what they call alien crosstalk, which is a pseudo-random noise source that you have to contend with. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to cancel out that noise source through the DSP and the electronics. So what you need to do is eliminate it through the infrastructure. So with Category 6, it was really, really never designed to support an alien crosstalk environment. So that's why you need to specify Category 6A for 10 gigabit applications. So for 10G base T, you can see it's fully specified at 100 meters uh, to support that data rate. And you can see there's other uh, you know, data rates that are uh, specified for the other media types. But again, this is a nice quick reference uh, chart that you can use to, to help you with your um, uh, specifications on the infrastructure. And uh, with SDVOE, again, sending uncompressed video at 4K resolution, uh, you're going to require, in many instances, a 10 gigabit per second link to do that. So with 10 gig, uh, your category 6A, at least on the copper, would be your minimum recommendation for that. If you're using category 6, you just have to be uh, aware of the distance limitations associated with that media type. Uh, the other thing that you have to bear in mind is the power. So with each cable type, uh, the gauge size is also uh, varying across each type. So category 5E is typically a 24 gauge cable. Uh, category 6 is around 23 gauge. So when you're sending power signals across um, these cabling systems, you just need to be aware that uh, there are some benefits to using the higher gauge size conductors for those applications. So things like power over ethernet, you want to you know, take a look at category 6A and 6 for, as options because of the better uh, heat dissipation characteristics across those cables. And to explain that a little more, uh, I already alluded to this, power over ethernet, this has been around for, for some time. Uh, the first standard was published in 2003. It was called the 802.3 AF. Uh, there's two wattages that are always specified as part of the power over ethernet specification. There's your source wattage. So for the uh, 802.3 AF, that was at 15.4 watts at your source, which is called the PSC or power sourcing equipment. And then at the load, which is called your power device, that was specified at 12.95 watts. And the reason the wattages are different is that you have to account for the cable losses across a 100 meter link. So you have what they call I squared R losses, which is your power losses across the cabling. So that's why you've got the two wattages specified. Uh, in 2009, uh, the IEEE published the 802.3 AT that increased the, your uh, PSC wattage to 25 and a half, actually 30 watts at the, at the source and 25 and a half watts at the load. Now as far as delivering your know, PoE, there's two ways you can do it. You can deliver it through uh, the switch itself. A lot of the uh, switch vendors that are here as part of the SDVOE Alliance, uh, Netgear, Semtech, uh, there's other folks that have uh, solutions. You can deliver the PoE directly from uh, the switch, but if you have a non-PoE switch, you can use an injector or a mid-span to get the power onto your cabling link uh, to power your device. So these are the different options that are out there. Uh, there is a new standard that we're developing. It's called the IEEE 802.3 BT. This is called uh, four pair power over ethernet. So the PSC on this one is gonna be, the sourcing wattage will be roughly 100 watts. And then at your load will be 70 watts. So if you think about all the different applications that could take advantage of a greater than 30 watt standard, uh, you can see the applications are quite diverse. You've got um, you know, building management systems like lighting fixtures, uh, virtual desktops, um, you know, IP-based security cameras that have pan, tilt, zoom, and heater blower. And then from an AV perspective, you've got monitors, uh, switches, and other devices that could be enabled by a higher power uh, solution. So this standard is on track to be published by the end of this year, in 2018. So you'll start seeing some more pre-standard equipment being um, developed for the market, but by 2018, you'll have a fully specified IEEE specification uh, in place. So real quickly on the, uh, the optical fiber. Uh, again, this is typically used in your building backbone. Uh, there's a couple different variants that we have here. We have uh, single mode fiber, 
which is characterized by an eight micron core and 125 micron cladding. You've got multi-mode fiber. There's two variations, 50 micron and 62 and a half micron. And typically in today's corporate buildings, uh, most people are using 50 micron cores. That's the more advanced technology. It works on what they call an 850 nanometer pixel laser source. So what you can do is you can reach um, uh, data rates of 40 and 100 gig uh, using multi-mode fiber, uh, using various grades of uh, you know, cabling. So similar to what I had before, I've got a chart here that shows the physical reach of the cable grade as well as the data rate that you could support you know, across uh, you know, each cabling system. So for OM3, you've got a physical reach of 100 meters for 40 and 100 uh, gigabit per second. Uh, you can't support 200 gig and 400 gig, but there's, uh, again, some limitations that you have to take into account uh, depending on the type of uh, cabling system and optical module that you've got specified. Uh, OM4 and OM5 are the other grades of multi-mode. That increases your distance specifications uh, to 150 meters. Again, you can support 200 and uh, 400 gigabit per second as well. And then for uh, single mode fiber, you can see you can support uh, basically kilometers of distance. So if you've got uh, backbones that extend beyond the building across a campus or across a metro area, you know, single mode is typically going to be your, your only choice in those situations. Uh, but again, from a backhaul or a backbone perspective, again, the beauty of Ethernet is that I can transport all of these signals across these distances, extend the scale of my network to meet whatever application that I'm trying to uh, deliver. So the last bit of infrastructure I'll talk about real quickly is wireless. Uh, from an AV perspective, really the, uh, the only application that we see today is really for audio. You know, typically, uh, you're, you're using Bluetooth, obviously, to stream stuff from your phone to a, to a headset or other type of you know, appliance. And certainly, you can use Wi-Fi to do the same thing. But from a, a pure audio, video, or AV perspective, you know, Bluetooth has probably the best penetration. Uh, but what this chart shows is really the different variants, uh, various options you have with respect to wireless. So again, we're all familiar with Wi-Fi. There's the 802.11 standard. You've got A, B, and G, which was kind of the initial uh, standard. The newer standards for 802.11, like AC and AD, that just increases the amount of data rate that you got across that system. So you can see for 802.11 AC, uh, depending on how you've configured your network, uh, you can achieve get, uh, data rates of you know, anywhere from 100 megabit per second to upwards of 7 gigabit per second on your backhaul. And again, the range is around 100, 100 meters or so. Now, from a controls perspective, uh, we see a lot of the Zigbee technology. Uh, this is based on the 802.15.4 standard. It's a very highly scalable full mesh solution. So for, for, for lighting control and some other control environments, Zigbee is really optimized for those you know, applications because of its scalability and low power. But you can see the data rate is capped at around 250 uh, kilobits per second. So really optimized for those control environments where you need uh, to be able to control a wide range of different you know, sensor devices across your network. And again, the range is going to be limited. Uh, Bluetooth 5.0, which is uh, being developed, uh, that'll increase your data rate to 48 megabits per second. Uh, but the interesting thing with the new generation of Bluetooth is that it increases the, um, the distance in order of magnitude to, from 30 meters up to 300 meters. So you've got quite a bit of range now on that Bluetooth um, system. Uh, but really what we're really excited about is some of the new cellular technologies. We're kind of the, in this uh, environment where LTE advanced is you know, penetrating, but with 5G just on the horizon, that's going to allow you to do a lot of interesting things across, across your network. Because uh, 5G, what it gives you is not only uh, improved bandwidth, but improved latency. So from a bandwidth perspective, you can see on a backhaul system, you can achieve 30 gigabit per second data rates across a 5G network, but what's really interesting about 5G is that you've got a one millisecond latency across that network that can be architected. So for applications like video, self-autonomous vehicles that need more real-time uh, control and delivery of data, you know, the, these 5G networks, when they, once they get implemented, will allow you to do a lot of things. So from an AV point of view, it'll be interesting to see how the use cases develop, uh, but certainly 5G is a technology that you may want to consider and you know, take a look at and prepare your networks for, for that advancement. So th that's really kind of all the, the solutions that we have there from a wireless point of view. All right, thanks so much for your time. I think what we're going to do now is we're going to do the drawing. So.